Hello, and welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, where we decode what the top 1% of people, we're talking iconic founders, renowned investors, best-selling authors, and outlier thinkers have mastered, and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, we dive deep to uncover the ideas, frameworks, and strategies that have helped build the world's best businesses, investments, and books. I'm Dennis Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Nicholas Cole for our latest book club episode. Nicholas is one of the most read writers on the internet. Over the past decade, he's written over 5,000 articles online and ghostwritten for over 300 founders, C-level executives, New York Times bestselling authors, Grammy-winning musicians, and more. He's also the co-founder of Ship 30 for 30, which is one of the largest cohort-based writing courses, as well as the author of numerous books, including his latest, Snow Leopard, How Legendary Writers Create a Category of One. In today's episode, we're going to decode category creation, including why it matters, how to do it well and how it's done poorly, and where to start your search for your own category of one. You can find a searchable transcript of this episode, as well as our episode guide, with ways to dive deeper into the ideas and topics we cover at outlieracademy.com slash 140. That's outlieracademy.com slash 140. Please enjoy my conversation with the author of Snow Leopard, How Legendary Writers Create a Category of One, Nicholas Cole. Nicholas Cole, thank you so much for joining me on Outlier Academy, this time to talk about your new book, Snow Leopard. Pumped to be here. Very excited to chat about the book, too. And this is the second time that you're going to be on. I don't off the top of my head remember the episode number of the last time you were on the podcast, but um, that conversation was a ton of fun. We will link to it in the show notes. And that was for a very different book that you that you wrote. Um, one of the things I, I, I'm going to start off with is I'm sure a lot of people listening are familiar with your story and a bit of your background. I think it'd be great just to give everyone a bit of a refresher. Can you start off by just sharing a quick sketch of your background? Oh, man, I'll try. I'll do the 30 second. Teenage... World of Warcraft player turned bodybuilder turned entrepreneur slash viral writer. This is how we how we got here. The business that I built, I, which is probably what we talked about in the first one, was a ghostwriting business called Digital Press. Wrote for hundreds of CEOs, executives, things like that. After about two and a half years, pivoted away from that business and. Now I have three different companies. One is uh, Ship 30 for 30, which is the largest cohort-based writing challenge on the internet, teaches people how to start writing online. Two is Category Pirates, which is me and two other guys, Christopher Lockhead and Eddie Yoon. And we write a paid newsletter on category design uh, and publish books like Snow Leopard. And third is a software business called TypeShare, which is a SaaS tool for digital writers, giving them templates and making it easy to write on the internet, never have to stare at a blank page again. One of the things, you know, we're going to spend most of this episode talking about Snow Leopard. One of the things that we talked about preparing for this that I want to make sure we we cover, because I think it would be super interesting for people listening, is your experience moving away from that service style business. So just as a quick overview, you know, in ghostwriting, you're effectively doing this on a one-off basis, one project at a time. It's service-based. And all the businesses that you have now are more recurring revenue software style businesses. And I know that that's been a huge unlock just talk about that experience and how much better of a business the businesses you're operating now are versus the services business you had before and what you learned by taking this leap of faith to kind of transition from one to the other. Oh, man. We, I don't know if we have enough time. There's so much I want. We've got time. We've got time. So <laughs> the reason I started a ghostwriting agency was because in 2017, 2016, wow, I quit my job, decided to go all in on being a freelance writer and fell into this world of ghostwriting. And all of a sudden, you know, I went from being this commodity freelance writer to these CEOs going, hey, if you're my ghostwriter, and they they were the ones who gave me the language. I didn't even know what a ghostwriter was. They said to me, oh, you're my ghostwriter. And I was like, oh, cool, now I'm a ghostwriter. And I started just by demand, I would just increase my rates, you know, 100 bucks for an article, 200 bucks for an article, 300 bucks for an article. And I remember I got up to like 800 bucks an article and I could write these articles in 30 minutes. I mean, I was very used to writing in this fashion because it was all after my Quora journey and everything. And I went and met up with my friend in, in Atlanta, a very close friend of mine. And I told him what I was doing. And he, he was the one who's like, well, why don't we just split this out? We'll hire writers. We'll hire editors. The editors will do the calls. The writers will write. We'll teach them how you do what you do. And we'll scale this. We'll build a business. 
And we ended up scaling that to probably at our height, it was probably about 2 million in revenue, 20 full-time employees. So, you know, 10 writers, 10 editors, and it was a little, probably no more, 24 and a couple salespeople, all of them full-time, all of them salary. And this all happened in like 18 months, you know, and I was 26, 27 and it was super intense and we had 80 clients and it was, and so, you know, we did it, like we scaled it, but the problem was because you're providing a service, first of all, ghostwriting is about as subjective as it gets, right? I mean, you're basically giving something to someone going, hey, does this accurately reflect you and your voice and your beliefs? And I mean, that is a hard, you're not selling like plastic widgets, you know what I mean? That is a hard thing to do. And then second is your costs all scale linearly. So every time we bring on a new client, I have to go, well, who's the writer and who's the editor? Every time I bring on six new clients, I need another writer and another editor. And so all it doesn't take very long for your overhead to get really, really high. You know, you're supporting all these salaries. I say high relatively. You know, all the people with $30 million businesses are like, what are you talking about? But relatively at that time, it felt like a lot. And so eventually I got to this point. I, w- I went on this trip. It was the classic entrepreneurial story. I went on this trip and found myself, you know, lying in a lagoon in Mexico. And I was like, what am I doing? Why am I, you know, why did I build this business? And it made me realize that no matter how hard I worked, I was running a business that could only scale linearly. The more services I sold, the more people I needed to hire. And that was it. And so I left that business. I took like a year, year and a half off, pandemic hit. And I just asked myself some really hard questions. Like if I'm going to spend all this time building a business, what sort of business do I want to build? And the only thing I kept telling myself was I want to build something that has quote unquote infinite scale. It needs to be able to scale without me. The whole ghostwriting business was dependent on me, you know? And so where I landed was education products, software tools, paid newsletter, books, right? All of these things, it doesn't matter if one person buys them or a million people buy them. It's the same thing. And drastically different businesses in so many different ways. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have to do what I did. You have to go through that journey and kind of learn that on your own. I mean, you know, clearly the a big point that you're making there is around linearly scaling costs. This, I, you know, this point that obviously a service business relies on you. And so you want, you clearly want to move to something and it makes, you know, enormous sense for anyone that's ever seen one of these businesses in the deltas. I mean, it's just insane. You're, it's like moving from an asset heavy business model to an asset light business model. You know, you're generating revenue off of one-time sales that are hard to replicate, you know, versus having a product that can just sell itself. And then you're refining the funnel. Very, very different. But one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, there, it sounds like it's all positive. What has been the challenge or what have been some of the challenges about building a business like the businesses that you have now? Just talk about that side of the coin. Yeah. I mean, I had, you know, one of my mentors used to say, you're, you're always picking a bag of problems. It's just depends on which bag of problems you want to deal with, you know? And so the benefit of building things that have infinite scale and infinite has quotes around it because, you know, you have to grow it. It's not infinite human beings. So (laughs) yeah, it's not infinite human beings and it doesn't just immediately go to level a thousand, right? Like you still have to build it and grow it, but it's the simple fact that you're dealing with more people, which means everything gets heightened, right? Positive messages happen 10 times more. Negative messages happen 10 times more. Customer requests happen 10 times more. Everything happens 10 times more. And so the good is more. And sometimes the things that you don't enjoy as much are more as well. And so you kind of have to be obsessive about creating processes that ensure that you try and protect your time and your attention as as much as you can. Because otherwise, it's very easy to fall into the same trap. Like I catch myself doing it all the time where you have something that's scalable. You have a digital product or you have a, com- a community or something And then people start asking you questions and it's very easy to fall right back into the, oh, well, I'm going to give you personalized something. And then you're right back to it's dependent on you. You're selling your time, right? And so breaking that belief in your head is, that's been very challenging for me, especially because all I knew were services. I didn't even really know about digital product businesses until a couple of years ago, to be honest. I only 
new service because I worked at an ad agency. That was the model I had. Yeah. I think most writers are clearly coming from a service-based type of employment too. So it's just like the way your brain is wired and it's very hard to wire your brain differently. I want to ask a, a couple of questions about Ship 30 for 30 because I think it's super interesting. It's obviously different than, uh, well, it's one of the it's one of the businesses you're running now. I think it'd be interesting to spend a little bit more time on it. You know, so you talked about that it's the lar- largest cohort-based cohort based writing, I think, program uh, in, in the world. Talk about, just maybe flesh that out a little bit more so people understand. And then I just want to ask a couple questions about what the pro- what the program is like. So maybe if you could just start with an overview. Yeah, so I'll kind of answer both at the same time. It's basically a, a writing challenge where everyone is challenged to write what we call an atomic essay. So 250 words or less every single day for 30 days. And the reason is because the, the primary problem that we want to solve is people not writing consistently. There's a lot of talented writers in the world. The problem is you don't do it enough, right? So it's not about talent. It's about consistency. So that's the primary point of view of the whole business. And then wrapped around it is a whole education curriculum. We do live sessions. We educate on the fundamentals of digital writing, how to write headlines, how to format your pieces, how to write Twitter threads, LinkedIn posts. Like We go through and give you all of that. But the primary mechanism is do it and then learn as you go versus just take a course where you passively learn, but what are you applying? You know, and so the business itself, I mean, you talk about scale. So I went to college and my degree is in fiction writing. And in my fiction writing classes, it was like 12 students, different experience, right? Cause you're, you know, you get a different level of involvement when it's a smaller type of thing, but there were probably, I'm going to guess 200 people in my creative writing department, 300, maybe We run one of these cohorts every eight to 12 weeks. And every cohort after 18 months is between 800 and 1500 people. I mean, we're running cohorts of like a thousand writers at a time, and we've only been doing it for a year and a half. And so that's the power of when you really understand, like most people or me four years ago would have thought, I want to build a writing education business. I got to teach all these people manually. No, you don't. You can use these other mechanisms to scale your teachings in different ways. You just have to be really conscious and deliberate about how you're choosing to do that. So it's been a really fun business to to build. I want to ask two quick follow-up questions on that. You know, thinking about Ship 30 for 30 and the fact that you've now run so many, you know, students through this program and that you're doing 800 to 1500 every time you do one of these about roughly once a quarter. I mean, that scale is massive. And so I imagine you've started to triangulate and see some themes and see some trends. The two questions I want to ask, maybe I'll start with one. What typically is the biggest delta that you see in people that participate in Ship 30 for 30 from the time they start to the time they end? Because obviously the goal is consistency. And so I imagine a lot of people are just like, I, I want to write. This is my forcing function by participating in ship 30 for 30 in writing. So clearly their writing velocity is increasing. What else increases and how do people change over the course of that cohort? Well, I'll say first, I give the ability for us to scale. I do not take credit for, I give all of that credit to my co-founder, Dickie Bush, who has much more of a brain wired for that, which has been an amazing combination. You know, I can take all of these frameworks and things I've developed over the years and he helps build processes around them. And all of a sudden we can expose it to thousands and thousands of people. It's really amazing. But the Delta between someone starting and someone finishing the, and the reality is most people, it's not that you finish, they then start and keep going, you know? And so that's the ultimate transformation. But I'll tell you, for every cohort, you have people that go, I've written more in 30 days than I have in three years. You know, I've written more in 30 days than I ever have in my entire life. And it's because when you make it small, that's the that was the whole aha around the atomic essay is when you make it small and actionable on a daily basis, 250 words adds up really quickly. You know, all of a sudden a week goes by and that's the equivalent of writing a long form blog post, you know, but if you tell someone sit down and write a long form blog post, it's very overwhelming. So that is the real transformation for me is, is when you break it down into bite-sized pieces 
everyone comes to the same realization, which is, oh, I can actually do this. Yeah, of course you can. You just got to make it actionable for yourself. I want to ask one more follow-up question, which is, you know, so obviously people participate in this program and the whole goal is this is the start of them continuing to write, you know, hopefully forever. And, and this is something that they're always doing to, to shape their thinking and get their thinking out on paper. The question I want to ask, though, is for the people that complete the program and go on to do really, really well, just subjectively, that could be they continue writing, they develop their voice, this becomes a bigger deal for them. Have you noticed any commonalities about how they approach writing, how they show up in Ship 30 for 30, just any traits for the people that are the most successful kind of graduates? Yes. Besides the classic stuff, which is, you know, it's the people that are most committed and the most disciplined and, you know, consistent, et cetera. This, this might be a nice segue into the Snow Leopard stuff, which is the people that are most successful are the ones that come to the realization that the goal is to become known for a niche they own. Again, took me a very long time to learn this as a writer. Your goal is not to just build followers. Your goal is not to rack up views. Your goal is not even to sell a bunch of copies of one book or your course or whatever it is. Your goal is to be associated with a specific, a highly specific topic that is relevant to a highly specific group of people. And when you become known for a niche you own, all of a sudden you can write a dozen books and you can create a dozen courses and you can build a dozen products because you know that that group of people is looking for that type of thing. Whereas there's a lot of people that, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of courses on that, how to build an audience, how to get more views, how, right? But, but none of it teaches you how to be different. That's, and that's the whole idea, right? And as long as you're stuck in a comparison game, it doesn't matter how many times you post a day. No one associates you with anything. That's, so that is where you start to see the real transformation of writers happen. So that is the perfect segue. And let's go ahead and make the segue. So for the rest of the time, we're going to be talking about a book that you wrote with two other authors as part of Category Pirates called Snow Leopard. We'll link to it in the show notes. The um, subtitle is How Legendary Writers Create a Category of One. And, uh, you know, I've had you on the show before. I, I think you're just... Uh, you have a very interesting way of seeing the world. And I think a lot of how you think about writing and audience building really resonates with me. So I was excited to read this book. And obviously a lot of it is directly applicable to what I do, what I'm doing right now on the podcast, what I've done for the last two years with this podcast, whether you're a writer or not, I think that this book, if you're interested in just how do you create a category and why is that important? Uh, it's been a fascinating book where I wanted to start was asking you about the Genesis. So I imagine that this had either been percolating for a while or you had an aha moment that said, this is the book that we need to write next around category creation. What was the genesis or the backstory about writing this book? Well, the real genesis was uh, Category Pirates, like I said, is with two other guys. And they both had been writing about category design, you know, invented the discipline long before I had even met them. And when we all got together, the original idea was, you know, we want to write a book about category design. And as we got down that rabbit hole, we started to realize, well, there's a whole bunch of nuances that go into this. I don't think we're writing one book. I think we're writing 10. And so we decided to start a newsletter, a paid newsletter on Substack. We started that in 2021. And, you know, we covered everything, how big companies build categories, how small companies build categories, how, you know, solopreneurs build category, like all, all these different examples. And one of the, probably because I started Category Pirates at the same time as Ship 30, literally the same month, I imagine that the success of Ship 30 is what was kind of the wave that was pushing a lot of this into Category Pirates. Because one of the questions that we would get all the time is, well, how does this relate to messaging? How does this relate to copywriting? How do you, if you want to create a new category as a writer, what do you do, right? So this, this niche specialty within this broader idea. And so Snow Leopard was essentially the culmination of a lot of different, you know, newsletters. We call them mini books because they're, you know, five, 10,000 words long. There's a bunch of these mini books, all specifically geared toward writers. And the more that we explored this rabbit hole, the more we realized, you know, the whole secret to messaging is it's not about louder, more often, better. Whoever said the, you need to see a brand seven times before you buy it, that is, it's just such a misunderstanding of what's happening. 
You know, the real power of words is taking where someone's thinking is already rooted and moving it somewhere else. And if you're successful at doing that, you literally have one of the most valuable skill sets on planet Earth. And so that's what the whole book was about. I want to start off with one of the ideas uh, that seemed like it stood out to me because it seems like the genesis of if somebody hears that, hears that title, you know, knows that it's about category creation, I think at least in my mind starts going into like, well, why? And one of the things you get into at the beginning of the book is competing with the same or trying to compete on the better access, which means you're just opening yourself up to massive competition because you're competing with other people that are doing very similar things. And so your only margin, your only advantage is to do it slightly better, which scales linearly, takes an enormous amount of work versus competing differently and competing on differentiation. I think it's really powerful. Can you talk about that idea a little bit and why that's so important? The simplest answer is if I say I'm going to be better than Hemingway, I'm going to be the next Hemingway, I'm going to do so much more than Hemingway. The only thing you're thinking about is that you should remember to go read Hemingway, right? All I'm doing is just reminding you that I am the next best alternative. I'm like Diet Coke. I'm not the real thing, right? And so what most writers do is they root themselves in, okay, I want to be a mystery writer. So I'm just going to say, I'm going to be the best mystery writer, or I want to be a memoir writer. I'm going to be the best memoir writer, right? But what they don't realize is they are unconsciously announcing to the world that I'm the same as everyone else, which means you have nothing sticky. You have nothing to hold on to. One of my favorite examples is can't say I'm an avid reader of the category, but I think the example is amazing, is romance. So if you come out and you're, you go, I'm a romance writer, right? Well, there's a gazillion romance writers. But the moment you come out and say, I'm a military romance writer, immediately the reader has to make a decision, right? They're like, ooh, do I want to read a love story about you know, the guy who goes off to war and, you know, leaves his honey at home and right? It's all focused on military, right? Versus then another writer comes along and goes, I write vampire romance. Ooh, all right, whoa, now I got to decide, do I want to watch vampires get it on, right? Like, so the whole secret, it really isn't that complicated when you think about it. The whole secret is take the category. So if you're like, I love mysteries, take the category and what is the different modifier word that goes before or after it? And if you don't have a different modifier word, you are not different. You you are under the same illusion as everyone else, which is if I'm good enough, if I am better, then I get the, the award. And you're not. You're just, you're just subjecting yourself to infinite competition. Yeah, that's super interesting. One of the things that obviously dawned on me, I think you touched on it a little bit in the book, is I think I would guess that part of why everybody defaults to competing with better or trying to, you know, competing against some alternative and saying, I'm, you know, I like this, I'm going to imitate it, I'm going to try to be better than them over time is because of fear. Because obviously in being different, you're putting yourself out there and opening yourself up to massive fear of just what others will think, what others will say. Is that your takeaway of why we're all so afraid? And if not, what is your takeaway of why people are afraid to be different? I mean, I think that, yeah, the deeply psychological reason is, you know, we all say we want to stand out, but really we all just desperately want to fit in. You know, that's, that's the deep psych answer. But I also think that especially through the entrepreneurial lens, how most people, whether you're a writer, whether you're an entrepreneur, you want to start a business, what you do is you look for where there already are a bunch of people. So you look at a, an existing category and you go, well, hey, there's tons of money being made in that category. Why don't I go in, do it better and get my slice? But this fails. It, it's kind of like pretending that gravity doesn't exist. You know, you're failing to realize that when you step into that category, someone had to create that. Where did that come from, right? It didn't just magically appear. Someone created the category that now has a bunch of abundance floating around in it. Okay. So you walk into the room and you go, I'm better. And everyone looks at you and goes, you didn't invent this party, right? This isn't your house. What are you talking about? And so it's this flawed mindset of thinking, oh, I'm reducing my risk and I'm, I can capitalize and I can be the fast follower. And like all of it is denying the fact that you are now are subjecting yourself to competition and signing yourself up for an uphill battle where you have to try and convince every person in that party to leave that house and to go back 
to the suburbs with you to go to your house party. That's going to be very hard. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. Versus if you just go create a different kind of party, right? You go, oh, hey, it's disco night. Oh, over at my house, we're having a, a pool party. Well, now the person has to choose. Do I want to be at a disco party or do I want to be at a pool party? Right? Versus you going, I have a way better disco party. They're like, nah, this one's, this is an amazing disco party. Why would I leave? Right? So it's, yeah, this is one of those things where it's, you got to really retrain your brain. Yeah. It's fascinating. You know, one of the things you said in the first page, which I really like, I'll just read is, you know, writers without niches are starving artists because, again, they're just competing in in these massive competitions. And writers with niches are category kings. You know, and obviously one of the things you talk about in the book that is the precursor to uh, everything we're kind of discussing is that there's been this rise of people wanting to be a thought leader. And all, all of this makes sense. People want more followers. People want social validation. The way that people, you know, think they can get that because they see other people doing it is by by being a thought leader, but then that opens you up to 360 degree competition. Any just commentary on, you know, people wanting to be a thought leader and the way that people generally go about that, which obviously is very wrong <laughs> based off the ideas in the book. Yeah. I mean, why does someone want a million followers? You know, first of all, if you gave the average person a million followers, they wouldn't know what to do with it. Right. So first of all, you don't even know why you want it. Second of all, if you go, well, no, I, if I had a million followers, then I then I could, right? The then I could dot, dot, dot. Okay, if I gave you a million followers tomorrow, nothing about your content quality has changed, right? You haven't gotten better, which means the vast majority of those people are going to wake up tomorrow and go, wait, why am I following this person? And then they're going to leave you. You're, it's like the person who wins the lottery, right? You don't know how to manage money. You're going to spend it all. Same thing with follow, the, the idea of followers. Third of all, it's wild how many people, I know a lot of people on Twitter who have 10 times more followers than me and make way less money. So which do you want, right? If you become known for a niche you own, you have a tremendous advantage, tremendous. And you can supply those people and help those people in a gazillion different ways. But if you're someone that just goes, I write things that go viral and I have a huge audience. Well, where do you go from there? You don't have any way to deepen the relationship and everyone defaults to, well, if I had a big audience, then I could do like brand sponsorships. Okay. Fun fact of the day, right? How much money does someone with a quarter million followers make? It's like a couple hundred bucks a month. You're, you're talking about like not far away from minimum wage. Right. So a lot of times I notice in this whole conversation, it's like people want things that they don't even understand why you want it. Yeah. yeah. Or what they get from having it. Totally. Yeah. What's the upside? And I would way rather have a thousand followers, but be super clear about what my differentiated niche is, what those people care about, what problems I'm solving, what they're interested in, and how I can help them at scale versus having a million followers and going, well, the internet thinks I'm cool, but like, my life's not different. I think one of the, sorry, the last point, the, I think one of the craziest things in the world is people that have like a million followers, but then still work a, work like a very average job. It's like you're internet famous, but nothing about your life has changed. And what's the point? And, and I think a lot of people go, well, you know, like it makes me happy. Okay, great. If you're happy from it, fine. But I don't think most people don't go, I'm doing it because it makes me happy. They go, oh, I want to be famous or I want attention. I don't or, think anyone wakes up and does the gratitude exercise and is like, oh, I'm just so glad I've got, you know, 50,000 followers or 20. Like that doesn't even factor into your life. It doesn't even matter. You don't even know those people most of the time. One of the things that obviously is related to that, that I really loved in the book is this term content free content, <laughs> which I think as soon as you read or as soon as you hear, you kind of know what that means. And then you, you know, couple it with this other idea of people sharing BGOs, you call uh, blinding glimpses of the obvious, which I think is just a wonderful, you know, phrase. Talk about both of those two things and why those are issues and what's happening there, why people default to that. So what's a uh, example of content free content, you know, so that would be like us having this conversation and you going, you know, Cole, give me your, give me your most helpful writing framework for writers. And I go, you got it. Step one, you got to do it. Step two, you got to show up. Step three, you got to give it your all. You got to keep going, right? Step, step four, you know, when the going gets tough, 
keep going again, right? And and there's nothing about that that you don't already know, right? All, all I'm doing is just saying the most obvious thing that the listener already knows, which means I'm not actually helping you. And the whole myth is that in order to build an audience, in order to have a quote unquote content strategy, your goal is to say the obvious thing as often as possible, right? Who cares what you're saying? Just post 87 times on Twitter a day, turn, read those tweets live on YouTube, turn the YouTube and do a podcast, right? It's all focused on how do I maximize the asset versus think about, well, what is the asset actually saying? And if more company, it's shocking to me that you have companies that have billion dollar marketing budgets and they can't even figure out how to get people to read their newsletter. I'll tell you why. Because all you're doing is pumping out content-free content. No one subscribed to your newsletter needs to be told the key to starting a newsletter is to start a newsletter. Nobody, zero people on human, on, on, on human, on human earth, on planet earth, zero, right? So I just, once you, you have to, again, untrain yourself. And I think most people look at someone with a quarter million followers and go, everything that person says is amazing. Oh, you have 10 million followers. Everything you say, say is right. No, pretend you don't know how many followers they have. How would you evaluate the content? You'd probably be like, wow, this is really average and very not helpful. Right, so you have to look at the quality of what's being said, not this perceived check mark of "oh, I'm this super special, you know, famous person." No, no. What are they saying? Yeah. Do you have any tips on how people can spot that in their own writing? And what I mean by that is, I'm sure there. I'm sure when when you say that and you give that example, there's people like, "Oh yeah, okay. Well, sometimes I do that." But my hunch is that there's also a a lot of people that are like, "No, I am doing something that's novel. Maybe it's just novel to me. It doesn't have to be novel to other. It just doesn't have to be novel to anybody else." So I think I'm doing something that's helpful, but I'm not. Do you have any good acid tests? Any I don't know ways of helping people be able to see whether their content is content free content. So it's a great question cuz you know now the the counterpoint the the nuance is there is a place for what we call obvious content. You know so obvious is like beginner stuff. Super just just press the button on the refrigerator, you know what I mean? Very basic. And there's a place for that if you understand what your niche is, who your audience is and what problem you're helping them solve. Right. Because sometimes if you're a complete beginner, you just you need step one. And if that's your goal, then yeah, you're successful at achieving that goal. But ultimately, as a writer, as a creator, even as an entrepreneur or business owner, your your true aim is to move up the content pyramid from obvious creation to non-obvious. Right. How are you how are you starting to say things that people haven't heard yet? That's literally the definition of thought leader. You are leading with new and different thoughts, right? So in Ship 30, I do this thing with writers uh, that I call the tequila test. The tequila test being, okay, let's say we're all sitting down and we're going to write an article called how to have an effective morning routine. And I ask everyone in the chat, you know, what are the things that we should put in our article, how to have an effective morning routine? And everyone says the same stuff, right? Wake up on time, have a big glass of water, have your coffee, stretch, go for a run, right? We've all heard these things. There's not a morning article routine that doesn't have these things, right? And I go, okay, that's great. Now, after you read one of those, do you need to read any others? No, of course not, right? Because all of the others are just saying the same exact thing as the other one. So if I come along and I go, I'm going to write uh, an article about how to have an effective morning routine. And the first thing that I give the reader is I go, hey, step one, the moment your alarm goes off, I want you to roll over, pop open some Azul tequila and take a shot of tequila, right? Immediately what happens? The, the reader goes, I've never seen that before. Oh, this is something different, right? So a very easy acid test for are you writing obvious versus non-obvious or bottom of the barrel content-free content is take a topic, make a list of all the things most people say about that topic. And now you don't say any of them. Now, what do you do? Right. And that becomes your forcing function for how do you say something different? And yeah, you have a moment where you go, I don't know what to say. Oh, good. Hey, by the way, that's the whole point of being a writer. (laughs) 
That's the whole point, right? So like- Well, it's also how you do thought leadership is you have to figure out what hasn't been said that needs to be said. <laughs> and it's, said. I think it's shocking that, you know, you say that to people and they go, I don't know what to say, right? Like that, that is the whole point, right? That's so the value. Yeah. yeah, the value is you going, I don't know what to say now, let me go figure it out. Let me go create something versus you don't need someone else telling you authenticity is key. If you don't know authenticity is key, you have a bigger problem. I love the tequila example because it immediately makes me extremely curious what step two in the morning routine was going to, was going to be. Because <laughs> if you're starting with a shot of tequila, just where do you even go from there? And what, is, what does the rest of the day look like? What That's sort of a great question. <laughs> you can answer that in the rest of the article. I want to spend a bit of time talking about the content pyramid. Um, you know, and this is covered in uh, quite a bit of length in the book, but it's fascinating. And I think it's helpful for two reasons. One, as we'll walk through it in a little bit, people will be able to figure out out, I think pretty intuitively where they are within this content pyramid. And it's very helpful just at making it a framework where you can kind of identify to your point earlier, you know, where you happen to be. But then the other one is, I guess, just it, it forces you to then think about, well, do I want to get to the higher rungs? And what does that look like? And what does that mean? And what are the trade-offs? And you do a great job of covering that in the book. So maybe we just start with level one and start to work our way up. And level one of the content pyramid as you covered in the book is just consumption. So this means, you know, as an example, we talked about ship 34 30. These are people who haven't written yet. Maybe they have a bunch of stuff in, in notes, note docs. Uh, they've thought about writing, but they have, they've just mostly are consuming and you have a really fascinating stat, which is, um, I don't know if it's historical, if it's, you know, timely, but basically the idea is like, if you look at any social network or platform around 1% of people create content, 9% of people curate and organize content, maybe share that in some way, shape or form. And then 90% of people consume content, which is staggering, but actually kind of, you know, makes sense at a, at a high level. Um, and, and you talk about, you know, this level one is just the move from passive to active. What else do you have to add to this? Anything else to add to this, the consume, you know, the consumption level, level one of the pyramid? Yeah. I mean, so my, we may have talked about this on the first, uh, the first time we chatted, but, you know, again, going back to my years as a gamer, I firmly believe like we're all playing a video game. Okay, whether we can have the matrix discussion another time, but the internet is a video game. Okay. And so your social profile, doesn't matter what platform you're on, your social profile is your avatar. You have control over how people see your avatar. And I think one of the things that doesn't get talked about enough is because we live in such a digital society now, whether you like it or not, whether you think you're playing the game consciously or not, you're playing the game. You have a profile, you're playing the game. And so when people go, oh, no, I'm not trying to do X, Y, Z with social media, like it doesn't matter whether you think you are or not. When you meet someone, they go and look you up, they look at your profile and they come to conclusions, right? We're doing it anyway. So part of level one is acknowledging that the game exists. It's just, it exists. And most people aren't even quote unquote playing the game. It doesn't mean you have to go be some guru. But understanding that like, it's almost like you have a vacant character. The character is just like standing there, right? And you're choosing to not do anything with the character, okay? And the jump in level one is going from uh, passive to active. So instead of just scrolling and consuming, when you land on a piece of content, you ask yourself, hey, interesting, how is that assembled? Why, why are they sharing that? If I was to share my version of that, what would that look like? Right. So you start to go through these questions of what does it look like for me to scale myself? That's that's what the internet does. You have you, you go to a bunch of coffee conversations, you say the same stories every time, you share the same tidbits about yourself every time. The internet allows you to scale yourself. Yeah, it's fascinating. And it makes you know a ton of sense. I let's move on to level two. We got five of these, so we've got one down, we got four left to go. Yeah. Level two, I thought was really interesting, uh, including some of the examples in level two, but level two, I just, the, the tidbit I'll give, please, you know, push back on this, add to it in just a second, but level two is around curation. It's curation centric. So you're still not coming up with your own original ideas. That's actually a couple levels, uh, you know, kind of beyond this, uh, you're not coming up with non-obvious ideas. You're just taking other people's ideas and you're curating them and you're, and you're sharing them or other ideas you found. And one of the things I thought was fascinating, there's two pieces of this that really stood out to me. One is the examples of Ryan Holiday and Tim Ferriss as, you know, fantastic curation centric people. 
for me, that kind of one, it immediately resonates on why that's the case, but it's also somewhat surprising. And it gives an example. I think it calls out that you actually don't need the goal isn't for everyone to get to level five. The goal is that there's one to kind of know that there's a progression and then figure out where what what level works for you. Can you talk for a little bit about the positive example of why Ryan Holiday and Tim Ferriss are good examples of like a powerful level two? Yeah, I mean, curation just means you're organizing other people's ideas versus sharing your own original ideas. And there's a a ton of benefit in doing that. I mean, think about how much knowledge there is in the world. The average person, we're not going to read every book that exists in our lifetime, right? So if someone comes along and goes, hey, I read 10 books and I'm going to distill only the important stuff down for you, you can read it in three minutes. That's really valuable, right? Because the curator, is now saving you, call it 100 hours, right? And so people like Ryan, Ryan Holiday, his story is fascinating. You know, his mentor was Robert Greene. And Robert Greene wrote, you know, 48 Laws of Power and Mastery and kind of all of these like historical and, and psychological books. But all of them are curation, right? All, all of them is, is him going and researching taking the old stuff and just modernize it, modernizing it, right? And making it easier to read. So Ryan Holiday goes, you know, he kind of had a uh, a jagged path. He didn't start here, but he eventually lands on stoicism. What does he do? He goes and reads Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. The average person hasn't read Meditations. And he goes, and he goes, I'm just going to make this really easy for you, right? And he's curating it. Tim Ferriss goes, hey, you're interested in high performance and how the elite people, you know, handle their lives. I'm going to go interview all of them, right? So, Curation is basically you saving other people time and you saving other people the learning curve of, of sifting through complexity to understand something. So you're great at distilling down. And that's a very valuable skill set, like not to downplay those writers and creators at all. It's very valuable. Yeah. Well, and one of the things you call out too, and I think this is really interesting and we should talk about it for a second, is that... I'm, I'm trying to think of, there's a wonderful quote that I wrote, I wrote down. Yeah, you've got it. Um, I think it's on page 10 of the book, which, you know, you start to get to the point of people need to, you for, you force people to ask themselves, do I want to be hyper-focused on a niche, which means I have a smaller audience to your point, you know, maybe I end up with hundred thousand followers instead of a million or whatever it is to use that as a stupid, va- stupid vanity metric. So people can, you know, have a strong point of view that might resonate with a small audience, or you can have stuff that's actually actually, uh, maybe somewhat generic, uh, it's evergreen content. It's stuff that, uh, you know, you can always say something about every single day and someone will be interested in it and you can have a, a bigger audience. But, you know, I think part of that is by a level two, you could potentially have a bigger audience than someone that is super niche and focused. Can you talk about that? Do you believe in that? And, and anything to push back on that? Yeah. So ultimately the, the role of creation and curation, I, I, I believe everyone should strive in some way to do both. There's days where I wake up and I create new things and there's other days where I curate existing things, you know, and, and both are valuable to readers in different ways for, in terms of how you build and scale yourself. I mean, yeah, it ultimately comes down to the question of what do you want, but if you're, so I learned this by writing on Quora, the size of the question dictates the size of the audience. So the question, how do I make more money is more widely applicable than how do I make more money as a nurse practitioner, right? Smaller question, smaller audience. And so when you're thinking about curation as part of your content strategy, it's more beneficial to lean into bigger questions because you can kind of grab all of those readers. But there's a nuance is that then you want to also have the other side, which is ultra niche specific so that you once you get all of those readers and attention you go oh well now this is relevant to you hyper relevant right so it's almost oscillating between the two that's super interesting moving to level three we'll try to get through the rest of these you know somewhat quickly and i want to ask some follow-up questions but level three then is you're starting to create your own content but you're making obvious connections between things. You're not in the non-obvious state, which I think is really interesting. Talk about, you know, moving into creation, starting with uh, with obvious and how that's different than non-obvious and just some of the learning curve there. Because I think one of the questions I was interested in, I'll talk about level four in a second, but how someone moves from level three to level four and if there's ever people that just stay on level three and if that's a fine thing. Yeah, I think the easiest way of thinking about it is think of obvious as 
linear. So how to go from A to B, you know? So for example, if someone's a master of Facebook ads, you know, they go, I'm going to show you how to 5X, 10X the conversion of your Facebook ads, right? There's nothing non-obvious about that. It's very like, I have a problem and you're going to help me do a couple things and I'm going to move from A to B, you know? And again, there's a lot of value in that, but it's worth remembering who that attracts and why, you know? Again, obvious content has its place, but it usually has its place for beginners, or beginners moving into something more advanced, but it's that's never going to be the thing for people who are like, I've been doing this for 10 years. Give me the crazy stuff, right? So it's, it's they're just different levels of where people are at on their journey. Non-obvious is less linear and more disparate, more exponential, more, I'm, it's like hap, things happening at unlikely intersections, right? So a lot of my point of view on on digital writing. Why does my point of view on digital writing sound different? Because a lot of it comes from the intersection of pro video game playing and writing. That's a very rare, most people don't mash those two things together, right? So non-obvious is connecting data points that almost shouldn't or, or aren't thought of to be as connected. And then you make the person go, oh, I never thought of that before. Why? Because those aren't two things or three things that you would normally put together. Yeah. I mean, to go back to your point earlier of, you know, writing is taking, you know, great writing is taking this idea in someone's mind and moving its position or making them see it in a new light. It's like the obvious connection is you're not moving anything. You're just talking about it. You're maybe sharing something that's somewhat interesting about it rather than as opposed to trying to move that and create these new connections in someone's mind. One of the points you make that I really like is obvious connections have a short shelf life and non-obvious connections have a really long shelf life uh, because they don't age. It's always likely to be novel if it's especially especially non-obvious. I thought that was interesting. And then you have one other point uh, around demand capture versus demand creation. Can you talk about that for a second and what that is? So I think in, in a, if people want to go down the rabbit hole, a really great example of the point you said right before that is I wrote a book two years ago called The Art and Business of Online Writing. In a lot of ways, very obvious. You want to write headlines? Here's how to write headlines. You want to improve your formatting? Here's how to improve your formatting, Right. And because a lot of the things I shared in that book are, you know, technology moves so quickly. So when you're talking about things as they are today, there's probably only a shelf life of a couple of years before the, the game changes. So even after, as we were writing Snow Leopard, even I was aware, I was like, oh man, that book shelf life, I don't know how long, may, maybe it'll make it 10 years. It's probably not going to make it very far beyond 10 years because a lot of the things that I shared are specific to how the game is played now. When we were writing Snow Leopard, I was very aware of that. And so I deliberately didn't use a lot of timely examples, right? It was more about psychology. It was more about how to think about it. It was more about things that have been true for 200 years of writing, you know? And I did that to increase the shelf life, right? Not only is it non-obvious, but it's going to last longer. So that's that's ultimately the the goal. So demand capture is the idea of you go to the disco party, right? And you go, I'm going to convince everybody to come back to my house, which is also a disco party. It's just better, right? Demand creation is when you show up and you go, I'm offering you something completely different. Here are all the differences between a disco party and a pool party, right? One, you got to wear your clothes. The other, no clothes required. Right. All of a sudden, the the reader or the listener or the viewer has to make a decision. Right. Do I want to wear clothes at a party or do I want to not wear clothes at a party? Okay. It's a good question. It's a good per, question. It's a great question. We all need to ask ourselves. <laughs> and so people think that you can't create demand. And yet no one asks the question, well, then how did the world get to be the way that it is today? Right? Like the things that we value, we are taught to value. No, it doesn't just happen. Someone shows up and goes, I'm going to tell you why you should value this. Or someone shows up and goes, I'm going to teach you why you shouldn't value this, right? And you can get really meta with, I mean, it's, this happens even in society, right? We, we teach people to devalue other human beings, right? So demand capture is when you go fight, you're stuck in the better trap. Demand creation is when you educate on here are the differences and I'm, and now you have to make a choice. 
this disco party versus pool party is, I mean, I can, I'm going to be thinking about this example like five years from now. I just love how vivid and visceral and different it is. And, it's, you know, it's I think it's just a really wonderful, simple framing of a, a big idea. Let's move to level four. You know, level four, then I've done the obvious connections. Now I want to move to non-obvious connections. Maybe that's because I want my stuff to be interesting six months from now, a year from now. I want it to have a, a longer shelf life. And basically, one of the things you say is that the, the premise of level four is that you're changing the world with your thinking and that non-obvious connections uh, have some maybe consequences or maybe downsides. And one of those is it can take a lot of time to catch on. And you talk about the Copernicus, um, Copernicus. Apologies for any astronomy fans uh, dilemma. And then this idea that, you know, what you what may happen is you may end up with a smaller audience, but that audience has raving fans as opposed, you know, so say you're 50,000 followers, 5,000 followers, maybe even these people, uh, you know, love and, and really pay attention to everything you share as opposed to 500,000 followers and no one could care less. People don't even probably know they're following you. Talk a, bit, talk a little bit more about non-obvious connection and just anything we haven't covered that you think is interesting that you would call out. I do want to double click on the downsides because, you know, again, it goes back to human psychology. People say they want one thing, but then their actions say another. And I imagine, you know, you you read that section in the book and you go, oh, I, I want to be a non-obvious creator. I want to come up with things that people haven't yeah, said You like before. the idea of you having like the, novel I, insights. Exactly. Totally. You like the idea of it, but A, you know, saying things that haven't been said before is not always comfortable. You know, it's, there's, there's some risk in that, you know, and B, there is a lot of truth to the fact that, look, the, the more different the thinking gets, you're going to lose a lot of people. You know, there's a lot of the world that doesn't want to think that doesn't want to be challenged. And so it's not about being like controversial or anything. It's just when you start going down a rabbit hole of a subject, you know, you start in the obvious land, which is just like, just tell me the basics, you know, but then the further you go, you, you want the stuff that you haven't heard before. And, you know, this book is a great example. I, I firmly, every writer should read this book. This book is, there's, there's I think not it's for any creator. <laughs> there's not a, I agree, but there isn't a book out there that articulates anything like what's in this book. And I've read a lot of them, because I was that writer going, give me the obvious stuff, help me, help me, help me. But the reality is I know that it's going to take a while and it might never happen. You know, most people might still be saying, Hey, you know, you got to go read, you know, Stephen King's on writing. If you want to be a writer. Okay. Let's just keep it real. I love Stephen King and I love that book, but there's nothing in that book that actually tells you what to do to advance your thinking, like anything in this book. So I think when you get into non-obvious land, you have to be very comfortable with the fact that your mission is way more on impact versus vanity metrics or even sales or any of those things. It's, it's really about advancing the thinking of the category you're in. And for me, I'm very passionate about advancing the thinking in the mega category of writing and publishing. One of the other questions that I wanted to ask you about is around category creation. And uh, there's a quote in the book that I love, which is what readers, listeners, viewers, and potential customers want isn't you, it's your category, which I think one for a lot of people is probably uh, in intuitive, but also shocking. And we'll talk in a second about how nobody really cares about your personal story. <laughs> but can you talk about that? Maybe flesh out that concept, that idea a little bit more. Yeah, this is a, a very hard one for people to wrap their heads around because what happens is most most of the time when a creator starts getting attention, they start to drink their own Kool-Aid. So they start to think, I'm the one who's special. And, and you can actually see it where if you go take your favorite, I, I, like I'm a writer, so go take your favorite author, go look at their first book and go look at their most recent book. And their first book, the big font is going to say the title, the idea, right? And the small font is going to say their name. Why? Because nobody knows who they are. And they're like, the only reason you're going to pick up this book is because you're interested in the idea versus, it's not like I'm some big fancy celebrity, right? You're not buying the book for me. You're buying the book for the idea. And then the book does really well. 
And then all of a sudden they wake up one day and they go, oh, you know what? They rewrite history. So they go, oh, you know what? I was the one who made it all happen. I was the one who was important. So then you go to their most recent book and what's the biggest font? It's their name. You buy this book because of me. And there's an irony of this where whenever someone's starting out, they most of the time they get it right. They get it right on accident. They go, I'm going to market the category. I'm going to market the idea. I'm going to market the thing that the reader is actually interested in. And oh, by the way, it's by me. And then the more successful the person gets, the more they believe their own hype, the more they believe they drink their own Kool-Aid, the more they think they're the reason people pay attention to them, the more they make their name bigger and the category smaller until eventually it's all just brand, 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 and and then they're no longer relevant. That happens over and over and over again. I want to talk in a second about myths. You have a great chapter about myths, and I, I picked a couple of my favorite that I think it'd be worth talking about. But I, there was another quote that stuck out to me. This is a little bit of a curveball. You may not have much to be able to add on to this, but you have a, uh, I think it's a snippet in a chapter around hard work and thinkers high. And there was one sentence in there that stuck out to me that I really like. It said, thinking about thinking is the most important kind of thinking. Can you maybe elaborate on that? Talk about why that's so important. So everything I just said and what we just talked about on that point, you know, most people that want to build themselves or even you want to build a company, you immediately start in execution mode. You're like, oh, okay, well, I see other people have a brand, so I need a brand. And I see other people posting on Instagram, so I need to post on Instagram, right? And before you do any of that, you need to ask a more important question, which is, well, how are you thinking about how you're thinking about going about it? right? It's like, why are you thinking you need to start there? That might actually be the wrong starting point. And so the majority of the work I end up doing at this point, you know, I, I kind of phrase it like in the beginning of my career, I got paid to write lots of words. Now I get paid to write two words because the one or two or three words that define your category literally is the difference between getting on a plane and landing in New York or landing in Miami, right? Because those two or three words shape which direction people are thinking. So before you start executing, you need to think about how you're thinking about thinking about it. Makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, you know, to, to maybe do a little bit of a weird corollary in productivity. And also I think for a lot of founders, they'd have the same feeling that to your point, a lot of people just jump into execution. They don't spend much time in planning. So maybe just a simpler way to say it or a more direct way of saying it is make sure that you spend time intentionally planning before you move ahead into execution. Yes. And being comfortable with doing it iteratively, like you can start, but then like every step you should question, like, am I now thinking about it the right way? Like if you, if you, I mean, you, anyone's built a company, right? Like the moment you reach your next milestone, it's like what got you here won't get you there. So you need to rethink, well, how am I thinking about this whole thing? Yeah, it's a never ending game and it never stops. And it is extremely, extremely, extremely iterative. I want to talk about some of those myths. One of the first ones that I really liked, uh, we don't have to spend a bunch of time on, but I, th I think we should talk about it for at least a little bit, is this idea, um, and it's a myth, that the most valuable form of marketing is your personal story. And I know, obviously, you know, kind of to your point about people jumping into execution, not spending time in planning, and just trying to replicate what they see other people doing, you know, there is, I don't know, people respond to or think, like, what's unique about me? Well, it's in my story, so I need to tell my story. It's probably not the right place to start. Talk about why that is a myth. Yeah, this is an extremely nuanced point. I say it a different way in Ship 30, which is you are not the main character of your story. The reader is the main character. And so that doesn't mean that you can't tell personal stories. It just means you have to understand why you're telling the personal story you are as it relates to the wants, needs, hopes, dreams, and ambitions of the reader. So for example, I can sit here and go, hey, Daniel, 2014, here's my story of how I got started writing on Quora. 2015, I launched this thing. 2016, and like for the first 15 minutes, you're you're going to be kind and you're going to listen, and then after about two minutes, you're going to go, "Wow, this guy just won't stop talking about himself," right? And that's we all do that. But if I say, "Hey, Daniel, I started writing on Core in 2014. You know, launched my first product 2015, and I remember you were telling me 
as a hypothetical example, you were telling me, oh, hey, I'm trying to figure out uh, how to start writing on the internet. Well, here are some of the things I wish I would have known earlier, right? I'm telling my story as context for the thing that I'm going to explain to you or to the reader. And so this idea of like, just share your journey. No one cares about your journey. They only care if your journey represents or exemplifies some sort of lesson or takeaway that is interesting to them. And you have to understand that there, there's a difference between the two. It makes sense. It's well said. Um, related to that, you know, the second myth that I thought it'd be interesting to spend a little bit of time on is this idea that anything I say is valuable, which sounds a little bit related. It sounds like you maybe need to filter that through a bunch of filters before you decide what to say. And, and you have thoughts about whether that's valuable to the reader or not. Expand on that. Talk about why that's a myth. We've all been in this experience where you know, especially if you've ever worked at a big company or you go to a conference or something, you know, it's like you've got this big fancy person with a big fancy title gets up on stage and like you're sitting there for 40 minutes and you're like, literally nothing that this person has said, A, makes any sense or B, is helpful to me in any way, you know? And a lot of times I noticed this when I was, I would ghostwrite for all of these, you know, really successful people, executives and founders and investors. And it took me a couple of years to realize that there is a monumental difference between being good at what you do and being able to articulate how you do what you do. They are different skills. There's a reason why Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time and the worst NBA coach of all time, right? Or NBA owner, sorry, because they're different. And so there's a myth where someone who's achieved success in their career, they go, well, I'm successful. So anything I say is helpful. And in reality, to someone who actually reads a lot or, or is thoughtful about what they're consuming or is a creator themselves, they look at it and they're like, you literally just told me to like wake up on time and authenticity is key and like, you know, do one more, right? You're not actually saying anything helpful. And so part of that then as a creator or in a lot of these cases, as people who want to be quote unquote thought leaders you have to be honest with yourself about the fact that, yeah, you might have achieved a lot in your career, but that doesn't mean you know how to articulate anything that you've done. And so you need to now go start over. You're playing a different game and learn how to articulate, create frameworks, create mental models. How do you help the next person versus, oh, I did it. So, you know, what I say is truth. Yeah. Going back to that ghostwriting example, did you have to have that conversation with the people whose books you were writing that, hey, this is all great, but none of this stuff is probably going to make it into the book. And here's how I'm going to change it or shift it. And or how did you help people shift their mindset around that? Or maybe that's just why they hired a good ghostwriter. I'm all the time. I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I was doing I did a couple books, but I did mostly articles on the Internet. Shorter. I mean, same thing, just shorter form. And Sometimes I would have the conversation, but in all honesty, this was a very hard thing for people to wrap their head around. I mean, if you've if you've been successful in your career for 30 years, the last thing that you want for me, I was 26, 27 at the time. The last thing you want is a 27-year-old telling you, hey, you need to go start over and you're not as smart as you think you are, right? So instead of saying it bluntly, I would have to just keep asking questions or keep trying to push the thinking. And what would happen is the calls that we would have would end up becoming like training sessions. You know, where it was the first time in their life where they had ever asked themselves, how do I think about problem solving? Right. Because the first time I say, how do you think about problem solving? They go, well, step one, you know, you got to just sit with the problem. And step two, you know, you got to talk to the people around you. And step three, you got to foster good communication. Like, cool. None of those things are new. Right. So now we got to, I got to ask again, how do you think about problem solving? And it's it's not until you ask seven or eight or nine or 10 times that the person starts to give you things that are original, that are unique to them. And then I go, okay, now we're on to something. But yeah, I mean, it is a different skill. Being a thought leader is not about getting a blue check mark or standing on a stage or saying Forbes thinks you're smart. Being a thought leader literally is practicing the skill of how do I articulate where the world is going in a way that no one else is able to articulate. Yeah, that's so well said. Okay, last myth, and then we'll move on to a couple more questions. 
And this goes back to a point you made, I think, multiple times earlier in the interview, which is, uh, and this myth is, it's all about how many people see your content. And so I'd love for you to maybe talk about why that's a myth and then answer the question, if it's not about views, what are other metrics or other means with which people should be maybe gauging their content? Well, here's a great example. And I'll say the asterisk to this is it, it really depends on the business model. You know, if you're a YouTuber, you live and die by views right? AdSense. Okay, great. I just want a gazillion views. But the example I would use is, you know, I've racked up, I don't know, half a billion views on my content, a lot. And I made very little, if any money on all of them, you know, now I made, I made money tangentially, you know, I, I, I was able to leverage views to, as credibility to get ghostwriting clients. And so I monetized the service, right? But I didn't actually monetize the views, which is an interesting point A. And point B, when you focus on views, you're focusing on catering to low common denominator stuff, right? So how do I tap into wants and needs of everybody? Or how do I tap into universal mistakes or universal fears or universal ambitions? And the problem is that what happens as a result is you get a lot of surface level readers. You get a lot of people that read, so you get the view, but then the comments are like, nice, or this was cool, right? There's no depth versus, you know, two years ago, I decided, okay, I have half a billion views. More views isn't going to get me anywhere. So I decided to do the opposite. And I was like, instead of focusing on views, I'm going to get laser specific on a niche, and I'm going to give people in that niche everything they need in order to be successful and answer all their questions. I'm going to solve all their problems. And that niche I picked was digital writing. And as a result of getting super niche, my views went in the garbage can and my earnings went through the roof. Because when you focus on a niche and you solve people's specific problems, you're not getting everyone's attention. And that's the point. But the people's attention that you are getting, they're the ones who go, you understand my problem better than anyone. I'm willing to pay you. I want to pay you. I want to pay you. I want to pay you. So it's like, yeah, it's a long way of saying chasing views for me was a basically a waste of seven years. Half a billion views. Cool. What did that get me? Not much. Yeah. Or, or maybe another way of saying it is like, it seems to be for whatever reason, uh, which is probably not all that mysterious, that everyone by default just biases for views because views feel like an, the easiest proxy you could pick for success. It's just how many eyeballs generally got on this, how many bots on Twitter generally saw saw this. Uh, and so it's, you know, don't, 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 don't do that and think deeply about what you do want to, uh, you know, go after and what metric you're going to use to gauge success. One of the chapters, I want to talk about two more chapters, uh, and then we'll move on to a couple of closing questions. One of the chapters, chapter five, is just, it talks about the power of a point of view. And one of the biggest questions um, that I just wanted to ask is if you could walk through, even just at a very high level, you know, almost kind of superficially, how you go about developing and honing a point of view. Because I think my, you know, perspective, um, whenever, you know, I think... I think it's probably difficult for people to argue with this idea that a point of view is powerful and is important and you need to have one. Even going back to the example you gave yesterday, working with a ghostwriting client, have to ask them the question six, seven times until you start feeling like you're hitting on something. You're like, okay, this is valuable. That maybe, maybe that's the way of you just need to dig deep enough. You get to your point of view. But the question I want to ask just uh, super open-ended is how do you think about, how do you work with people? How do you encourage people to develop and hone a point of view? I mean, here's a great uh, case in point. Every venture capital firm on planet Earth says the exact same thing. We invest in entrepreneurs building the future. And they all say we have a unique point of view. But if you ask them to articulate, well, what's your unique point of view? 99% of them can't do it. They just go, well, we're, inv we're, we're investing in great entrepreneurs and we look for rare, unique opportunities and you know, entrepreneurs focus on building the future. Cool. None of that's different. You literally just said the same thing as everyone else. You just tried to say it with more conviction. So we talked about the tequila test. You know, you ask people, how do you write, uh, you know, an article like a morning routine? In order to figure out what your unique and different point of view is, you have to first acknowledge what are the existing point of views. Make a list of them. 
You know, so the morning routine article, what are all the things everyone says? Wake up on time, have your cup of coffee, stretch, go for a run, you know, whatever. So make a list of all the existing point of views. Okay. Now you can't say any of that. What's your point of view? It's crazy when I do this, when I do these exercises with people, because it's like they go, I understand. And then they like magnets, they just immediately gravitate back to, but I like that old point of view, right? It's comfortable. It's what I know. No, that's what I resonate with. That's fine. Just realize now you sound like everyone else. So, and, and, and I think whenever I try and articulate this, the counterpoint and what I often hear back is someone going, oh, so you just want me to be controversial. No, that's a misunderstanding of the point. I am not saying go be controversial for the sake of being controversial. I'm saying start with the way the world is and consider none of those are options. So what do you do? And I'll give you a, a great example. So me with writing, and I did this on accident. I was I didn't even have the language for all of this when I when I came up with this. My point of view was don't start a blog. Now, if you ask anyone about how to start writing on the internet, especially for the past 10 years, 10 out of 10 people will tell you, you should start a blog. So when I come along and I go, that step one that everyone else says, I think is wrong. And I wasn't saying that to be controversial. I was saying that with a legitimate reason. I said, hey, I found another way. If you don't blog and you write in social platforms, here are all the benefits rapid fire feedback loops. You tap into hundreds of millions of readers. It's easier to measure what topics are working, right? So I'm not being controversial for controversial sake. I'm saying I am giving you a different way of thinking about the thing that you're thinking about doing. And all of a sudden it forces a choice. Everyone has to go, do I want to believe the old start a blog or do I want to hear what this person has to say? And it's in that choice. It's in that chasm that you have the opportunity to educate people on something different. But if you don't ever give them a different starting point, then you're just another VC saying, I invest in the next great entrepreneur building the future. Yeah, that's well said. I'd love to ask a couple of closing questions. One of them that I wanted to ask is, you know, you have, uh, you're one of two other founders of Category Pirates, and you guys have a sub stack that's been incredibly successful. You have this book, Snow Leopard, that we've been talking about. I imagine as a writer, before you joined this team and wrote this book, you had thought a bit about category creation, but I assume you've probably learned a lot from your two other co-founders and from the process of doing this. What have been the biggest surprises or ahas or lessons learned either from your co-founders or just the process of spending more time thinking and writing about category creation? I think the biggest thing is not underestimating the power of every single word. You know, again, I'd say when I was younger, I got paid to write lots of words. But looking back, I didn't know why I chose 90% of those words. You know, it, it's you're, you're kind of more focused on just writing. It's like you, you're doing, you're doing a lot. And as you learn and as you clarify your thinking, you start to realize how powerful one single word is. If I say it's a car or an electric car, one word drastically changes what we're looking at, right? If I, if I say it's a impressionist painting or a cubist painting, one word changes what we're talking about. You know, it's a dollar, it's a crypto dollar, changes what we're talking about, right? So the whole idea of, of category creation and category design is it's about being extremely specific about what words you're choosing and understanding what responses those words elicit from people. What problem are you talking about? And one word drastically changes what problem we're talking about, you know? And so that's why, again, I say I used to get paid to write a lot of words. Now I get paid to write two words because those two words directionally change how the person's thinking. I think I used the romance example too. You know, you have like military romance or vampire romance. One word drastically changes what type of book we're going home with. A massive difference. <laughs> I want to, so, you know, uh, 
if everyone listening, I highly encourage you to go and buy the book Snow Leopard. You can get it on Amazon now. You can also go to uh, CategoryPirates.com and you can sign up for the Substack, which is a weekly newsletter, a paid newsletter. I think you guys put out. Those are both. If you if you've listened to this conversation, if you're bought in on the idea that category creation is important and you want to spend more time doing it, those are two great ways to go and do that. But I want to try to give people a little tidbit of something actionable that they can do to move from being just competing on the better axis into actually moving into category creation. And, you know, we haven't talked about it much in this program. You can talk about it a little bit now if you want to, but I know that you and your two other, uh, you know, co-founders also do this work for companies. It's very highly paid work. You see, we'll do the, these intensive workshops. So, you know, the, I guess just to ask the question again, what I'd be curious is for someone listening who's bought into this, you know, they can go and learn more about category pirates. They can, they can um, buy the book Snow Leopard, but what maybe can they start thinking about and start doing to move from competing on better to actually thinking about, okay, well, now what's my category? It's a great question. It's a loaded question. I mean, I would say directionally, the biggest thing is you are looking for the weird data point. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of what everyone says. So step one, what are all the problems that people have in your general mega category? You're like, I'm interested in productivity. Okay. Well, what are all the problems that people have in productivity? And if you take the time to, to list out what are all the problems people have in productivity or all the problems people have in yoga or all the problems people have in IT, whatever it is, you're going to know which problems are the popular ones to solve. You're going to be like, oh, everybody solves those problems, right? And you don't want to do that. You want to go, well, what's, what's the ignored stepchild problem? right? What's the problem that everyone's like, oh, that's too small. That's too weird. No one's going to focus on that, right? Ship, Ship 30 is a great example. Like I even, if you asked me two years ago, how many people have a problem called, I can't write every day. At first glance, it's like, that's weird. And that's really small. And then you start building it and you're like, uh, actually that resonates with millions and millions and millions of people. Right. So first look for the weird ignored problem. And then you do the same thing on the solution side. What are all the solutions people offer? And you're going to see, oh, those are the popular solutions. Everyone always suggests those things. Okay, great. You can't do those. Now, what do you do? Look for the weird solution. Right. And then you start to marry weird problem and weird solution together. And now what do you call that? Don't just say, oh, I do all these things, right? What do you call solving the weird problem with solving the weird solution? And what you call that, the language you pick is usually an intersection of an opportunity to create a category. And this is one of those like, are you going to figure it out in 10 minutes? Probably not. But is it rocket science? No, you just you just need to sit with it. And, and one of the things that we talk about is, and you need to use data. Write, publish, record podcasts, make videos, make things and try and figure out, is this intersection of weird problem and weird solution compelling? And if it's and the beauty of the internet is if it's compelling to one person, it's compelling to 10. And if it's compelling to 10, it's compelling to 100. And 100 to 1,000 and 1,000, right? And it just, it's the internet scales that. But you have to find the one. I mean, in many ways, landing on and closing out on find <laughs> find the weird data point, you know, figure out the weird solution uh, to, to the weird uh, unaddressed problem uh, is not the answer I expected, which is why I love one of the reasons I love doing this podcast. Uh, and you've been an amazing guest. Thank you so much for joining me, Nicholas Cole. This has been so much fun. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. You can follow Nicholas Cole on Twitter at NicholasCole77. And you can learn more about Ship 30 for 30, which is one of the largest cohort-based writing courses online that kicks off every 30 days at startwritingonline.com. For more from Nicholas Cole, listen to episode 139, where he joins me on 20-Minute Playbook to break down everything from his habits and routines to his favorite books, the best advice he's been given, and more, all in less than 20 minutes. You can find a searchable transcript of this episode as well as our episode guide with ways to dive deeper into the ideas we covered at outlieracademy.com slash 140. That's outlieracademy.com slash 140. 
For more from Outlier Academy, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash outlieracademy or visit outlieracademy.com for more incredible book club episodes profiling books and authors like Wired founder Kevin Kelly and his latest book, Vanishing Asia, Silence in the Age of Noise and Philosophy for Polar Explorers by famed Norwegian explorer Erling Kage, Impact by Sir Ronald Cohen, Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez and more. We'll see you right here with a brand new episode of Outlier Academy next Wednesday.